Good morning, everybody. First session of the day and of the week, in fact. For those of you more astute and those familiar with operating system deployment, you've probably noticed I'm not Aaron Joukowsky. My name is Rob York. I'm a program manager with the customer acceleration team for configuration manager and Intune. Aaron can't be here today, so he asked me to fill in for him and run through what's new in operating system deployment, system center configuration manager, and also Microsoft deployment toolkit. I've put my Twitter handle on here because it amused me a few weeks ago when Aaron IM'd me and said, hey, do you have Twitter? I'm getting a lot of people asking about my session. I'm going to put a tweet out. I want to include you. I was like, I, I have Twitter. I don't use it. I signed up like a year ago, mainly to follow comedians and maybe with the vague notion that I might use it to complain to my broadband or power provider. So I'm a pretty boring Twitter user. And I figured that given that there was interest in my Twitter profile, this would be a good opportunity to put out my first tweet. And I'm a little bit ashamed to say it, but I am quite a prevalent selfier and kind of born with an inbuilt selfie stick. So if you all guys want a photo bomb, I'm going to take a selfie and we'll put that up on Twitter at the end of the session, and that'll be my first tweet. How's that sound? Excellent. Took a couple just in case, so we'll stick that up on Twitter at the end. Don't want to break the flow too much. Um, it seems that the door monitors did their job and put the pretty people down at the front, so thank you guys for doing that. And let's get started. So in today's session, as the title might suggest, we're going to cover the new and upcoming features for operating system deployment, some of the stuff that you might have seen if you've got 1606, some of the stuff you might have seen if you've been checking out our technical previews, but also some other stuff that's coming up in our latest technical preview and some stuff beyond that. We're also going to look at the different methods that you can use to deploy and manage Windows 10 within your environment. And the key takeaways for today, I want to get the first one out there nice and quickly. If you want to go fast with Windows 10, you need to keep that momentum and go fast with SCCM. Key takeaways are also going to be the new features for operating system deployment, and also the fact that your Windows 10 servicing deployment strategy should include upgrade, provisioning, and servicing, not just the standard imaging that you're probably used to. I appreciate there might be questions. We've got enough time to cover everything today, but if you can hold the questions till the end, that means that the questions overrun rather than the session. So if you just hold your questions to the end, I'm here all week. I'll be down at the booth, ask the experts. So we'll make sure that you get the answers to any questions that you have. Before we jump into operating system deployment fully, just wanted to take a few slides to make sure that there was a, a set of a level set within the room as to the new version of Configuration Manager. Just this week and yesterday, talking to some customers, they don't realize the, the changes that we made back in December around the release and the current branch. So we're just going to go through what Config Manager and what our release cycle looks like. So these were the, the reasons that we changed our deployment and our rollout strategy for SCCM. We really wanted to simplify the upgrade experience, not just going from Configuration Manager 2012 onto current branch, but also because we've got a faster release cadence three times a year, we wanted to make sure that that update process between those builds was as easy and as seamless as possible. And the reason that we've moved to this three times a year model is that we're being expected by our customers to support the release cadences of some of the services that Microsoft offer. So Windows 10, Office 365, and Microsoft Intune. Microsoft Intune especially, every month they're releasing changes and updates to that service. The old model of Config Manager, customers were not happy with us going, yeah, we can light up that feature in 18 months' time with our next service pack. So we've moved to a faster release cadence in order to keep customers up to date with the feature sets that they're expecting from the dependent services and the interlocking applications that Config Manager touches. One of the great advantages of this faster release mechanism is that we're able to listen and respond quickly to customer feedback. And my very role is representative of that. As I say, I work for the customer acceleration team, an outreach part of the product group, working with our customers, listening to their concerns, their ideas, their blockers, and feeding those directly back into engineering. And we're able to 
put those changes into the product much quicker because we have that three times a year release schedule. So the latest version of Configuration Manager is simply called System Center Configuration Manager. We've dropped any notion of any year suffix to the name. And we denote builds within current branch in the same way that Windows 10 represent builds. We use year, year, month, month. Um, our first release was back in December, denoted as 1511. Since then, we had 1602, which released in February, March timeframe, and most recently, 1606, which we released back in July, August. You can defer any update for up to 12 months. So if you're on 1511, you can defer 1602 and 1606 and still remain supported. And you can move from any supported build to any supported build. So if you're on 1511 now and you want to go to 1606, that's a supported direct upgrade path. As well as the current branch, we're also releasing technical previews every, every, every single month. And they're also denoted by the year, year, month, month. And it's key to point out that this is a separate build from our production build. The technical preview is not intended for any production use at all. It's intended for a sandbox test environment, really so that you can kick the tires of the features that we're planning on putting into the production build. And you can't go between production and technical preview. They're completely separate installs that you would have. So we have seen a little bit of confusion with some people as they've seen an article that says technical preview 1606 has XYZ feature but then they're expecting that to be in their production build of 1606. Technical preview and current branch are two distinct builds. So moving on to the Windows 10, which you're here to, here to hear about. So Windows 10 support with the previous versions, and in the purposes of this, Config Manager SP1, uh, 2012 SP1, and Configuration Manager 2012 R2 SP1, they're essentially the same build of Configuration Manager. We support existing features, so any app compat features across Windows versions that are still in Windows 10, we support those. And in terms of Windows 10 branch support, we only support Windows 10 LTSB 2015 and the 1507 and the 1511 builds of Windows 10 only. So you remember I said that if you want to go fast with Windows 10, you need to go fast with, S uh, with SECM. If you want to deploy Windows 10 1607, you need to be on current branch, and more specifically, you need to be on that 1606 build in order to deploy the latest version of Windows 10. If we go back even further and look at Configuration Manager 2007, we only have App Compat for the client, and the branch that we support is only Windows 10 LTSB 2015. If you want to deploy LTSB 2016, or the 1607, you need to be on 1606 in current branch. Within Windows 10, there are a number of different branches that you might then be deploying within your environment. The first one is the Windows Insider Preview. And this is Windows 10's pre-release, again, allowing you to kick the tires of the features, do some initial piloting. This will be the smallest group within your organization that you target. Small group of test machines, maybe some of your IT staff might be using it as their early adopter program, but it really will be the smallest subset of Windows 10 devices in your organization. The next one, slightly bigger, is the current branch. So the current branch build of Windows 10 is the one that's available on day zero after Windows ship uh, a new build. Again, this is going to be early adopters and your, pi your, t your, your time period to pilot the upcoming build to make sure that it works with your applications and your processes. Once that build goes current branch for business, that's most likely going to be your biggest bulk of your Windows 10 devices within your organization. And massive broad deployment, hopefully broken down into some slightly smaller stages within your organization. If you're a 400,000 seat customer, we don't expect you to go and deploy Windows 10 current branch for business as soon as it goes live. There's going to be some nuanced stages to that. And then finally, there's the long-term servicing branch. This is a static build that we don't apply new features to that allows you to have a more locked down environment. And this is really intended for specialized systems. And by specialized systems, I saw an email on one of the internal aliases from Michael Niehaus the other day, and, and he called it really well. He said, if there's office on that machine, 
it's probably not a specialized machine. It's more for the ATMs, the production lines, the healthcare equipment that's running heart monitors and whatever else important life-saving equipment that's being managed by that Windows 10 device where you can't be pushing out a new build of Windows 10 every six months. You need to have that locked down. If there's Office on there, it's probably more just an information worker device and really the intention would be that that would fall in the current branch for business. Always in Config Manager, there's always been a number of different methodologies that you might have for deploying Windows, and that's no different within Windows 10. And in fact, that subset is, is increased. So we still have imaging, bog standard WIM deployments that everybody in this room probably knows and loves. It's great for those bare metal wipe and reload or refresh scenarios, and it's great for those major system changes or a hardware refresh. But with Windows 10, we also have the ability to upgrade. And the upgrade is a great, quick way to uplift a user from either a previous version of Windows, so Windows 7 or Windows 8, and also build to build within Windows 10. And the great thing about the upgrading is that it preserves the user's data, the applications, and the settings. We just simply swap out the OS from underneath that. We also have provisioning. So this is the scenario where user gets a device out of the box, it's already imaged with Windows 10, and we then put a provisioning package down onto that box in order to lay down some control and some configuration. And then finally, we've got servicing. So Windows as a service, most people have probably heard that term, Windows as a service provides those Windows 10 build-to-build -build upgrades. So being able to go from Windows 10 15.11 to Windows 10 16.07 natively within Config Manager without having to do the wipe and reload. So before we look at what's new, we're just going to have a, a recap of imaging in Windows 10. Not really a great deal changed there. So why is imaging still relevant? I've just listed off all these new changes that Windows 10 has brought. So why is imaging still relevant in the modern workplace? So there's still scenarios where a device might have come out of a box or it's had a hard drive swap. So if there's no existing operating system on that device, we can't provision it, we can't upgrade it, we can't service it. We're going to have to image it in order to get it to a position where we can do that new stuff later on down the line. There's also a number of complex scenarios that we've seen customers have where imaging is still absolutely the right choice to make for making those, those configuration changes. So maybe an architectural change, if you've got 32-bit systems and you're moving to a 64-bit system, BIOS to UFI conversion, and we'll talk about that later on. Or even something like maybe changing your disk encryption provider. If you want to move from a third party into BitLocker, you're going to need a task sequence to do the heavy lifting of the pre and post tasks to decrypt and then re-encrypt. Re Some organizations also like to take their major operating system rollout as a chance to hit the reset button on their build, start from scratch, build it back up, and make sure that the devices they're deploying to their users are clean, best fit for the current work environment. So again, if you want to do that wipe and reload, imaging is still the right way to go. And then finally, there are still, or should I say, customers find that technology is easy, and that's pretty much my job. I go to customers and say, hey, you can do it like this. And they go, yeah, we could, but we've got X, Y, and Z process that's going to take us at best a year, 18 months, five years to change. So if you have that situation where your technology is moving faster than your process, you can continue to use imaging while working on the processes to enable you to light up the new features. Depending on the build that you choose of Windows 10, there's going to be different image management methodologies. If you're using the LTSB build, this is pretty much business as usual. Windows will release a new LTSB build, you go ahead and you work on rebuilding your image and starting from scratch. If you're using current branch, that cadence is going to be a little bit quicker. You're going to have to be revising your image every six to eight months, depending on how quickly you react to the Windows 10 build. And then current branch for business, that's going to be revised between eight and 16 months, again, depending on how many builds you're going to skip within that period. It's worth calling out that feature updates cannot be currently serviced offline. 
So you can't use the offline servicing features of DISM and Config Manager to up, uplift a WIM to the latest build. You need to start from scratch and rebuild that WIM image. And you're going to need to use something like SCCM or MDT to do that build creation in exactly the same way that you are used to today. I've seen quite a few questions, both internally and from customers, as to which version of the ADK is supported on which version of Configuration Manager. And it pretty much falls in line with our Windows 10 support. So we have N minus one support for the ADK. So you'll see that the 1607 ADK is supported on the 1606 build of SCCM, but we also support it on the 1602 build of SCCM. But you'd only need to uplift that if you wanted to start deploying 1607 with your 1602. Or, quite often, the way it works for customers is they need to, they'll uplift their ADK prior to updating the site server. So it just provides you that upgrade support. Microsoft Deployment Toolkit is another component that customers use for Windows deployment. And as such, we need to update that. There's going to be an update to the Microsoft Deployment Toolkit coming in the next few months. It's going to land in Q4 2016, all being well. And at the same time, we've made the same decision that we made with SCCM to change the naming topology of, of the product. So you won't see any suffix to the name of Microsoft Deployment Toolkit. The next version of MDT will simply be called Microsoft Deployment Toolkit. This allows us to be not constrained to a version being, appearing to be out of date. We'll simply provide updates to Microsoft Deployment Toolkit as and when it needs the update based on the testing that we've been doing with the Windows product group. And at the same time, the new version of Microsoft Deployment Toolkit is going to introduce support for current branch of Configuration Manager 1606. It's also going to bring in support for Windows 10 1607 and also support for Windows Server 2016. So when that version lands later this year, you'll have support for all the latest and greatest OSs and dependent products within your organization. As for Configuration Manager support, as I say, if you want to deploy 1607, Windows 10 1607, you need to be on 1606 in order to fully benefit from the changes and the improvements that the Windows product group have been making. The support lifecycle is governs what you will get as phone support. There's no forward compatibility guarantee for any of the existing versions. So as I've said quite a few times already, if you want to go fast with Windows, you need to go fast with SCCM. And this is a little bit of a private joke between me and Aaron. He's been banging on about this for so long. He said internally a little while ago, I've said this so many times, I'm just going to go and make some T-shirts. Those T-shirts haven't, haven't appeared yet because, well, I don't think he actually wants to pay for them. But I thought with the wonders of Photoshop, I'd first of all bring you Aaron because I know a few of you were hoping to see him today. So there he is. But also he gets his T-shirt that he's been asking for. I mentioned that there are complex scenarios that customers face that mean that they need to use imaging rather than servicing or provisioning. And this is one of the biggest ones we've seen from customers over the past maybe six to 12 months, is BIOS to UEFI migration. And the problem is that if you've been maybe deploying Windows 7 on newer hardware, but in order to give app compatibility and consistency across your estate, you've been putting those newer devices into BIOS legacy mode, we can't then uplift that to Windows 10 and benefit from the UEFI. We can uplift it to Windows 10, but it will continue to run in that BIOS legacy mode. The only way to move from BIOS to UEFI is to wipe the box, reinstall Windows, and build it up with the UEFI partition. So you've got two options, really, natively. Do you do the in-place upgrade now, as I say, and just continue to use the BIOS underlying? And you could maybe wait for your hardware refresh. So as you start getting new devices that a user's not been using, you make the switch over to the UEFI subsystem. There's a lot of benefits that come to users that are moving to UEFI and Windows 10. You get the secure boot functionality. You get Passport for Work, Windows Hello. Um, 
or the trusted installer benefit. So there's significant benefits for customers moving to UEFI, but it just depends whether you think that your timelines are going to align exactly so that as soon as you start deploying Windows 10, if you think you're going to want to light those up, then unfortunately there's not really been a, an easy solution for you out of the box. There's been a couple of third-party solutions that we've seen, and, and, and they all work. So MCS, Microsoft Consulting Services, have been working on a solution that they can work with customers through. One E have a solution, and I believe there's a session later this week where they are taking the opportunity to show you the virtues of their solution. And also, Jorgen Nielsen has written a blog on how to achieve this. But ultimately, it required two task sequences within Configuration Manager, one to do the reformat, and then one to do the rebuild of the new Windows 10. We're currently working on an OEM conversion tool task sequence step. So this will allow you to take the tools that the likes of Dell, HP, Lenovo provide for that conversion. You can then run that natively within the task sequence so that you can achieve a single task sequence approach to doing your BIOS to UFI conversion. Ultimately, it still requires a format of the device. So if you want to preserve user data and settings, you're going to need to use the user state migration toolkit. But hopefully, that will represent a significant administrative effort reduction, because you only have to have that one task sequence in order to achieve that functionality. And that will be landing in the technical preview 1609, which should be out sometime this week. So very quickly, very soon, you guys are going to be able to download that technical preview and kick the tires of that feature and let us know what you think of it. So what's new in 1606? I appreciate 1606 has been out for a while, but it would be remiss of me not to run through the improvements that we've included in the latest version of SCCM. So the big one, and we've talked about this already, is support for Windows 10, 1607, and all the associated ADKs that go along with it. We also deprecated the OSD preserved drive letter variable. And on the face of it, this can seem quite scary, because personally, I ran into this quite a lot when I was working with customers in the Windows 7 timeframe. For those of you that aren't familiar, there's been a few issues over various releases of Windows, where if you take the install.wim from the install media of of the latest version of Windows and try and deploy that with SCCM, you end up with the OS drive being installed on, I think, Windows 7, it went to the D drive. I think Windows 7 SP1, or was it Windows 8, went to the X drive. And it was to do with how that image had been captured when, we were, when the Windows product group were creating that media. So what this variable did is it forced SCCM to make sure that the C drive was used on that built machine, regardless of where it tried to go. So the deprecation of that could seem quite scary. But actually, what we did is we looked at the actual underlying cause of why the operating system was going to the wrong drive. And it turned out that we were kind of getting in the way of ourselves. And it was something that SCCM was doing that was trying to force the, the, the drive back to where it should be. So we've made a change to our code. And we're just going to let Windows Setup do what Windows Setup wants to do. So the result is that regardless of where it would have ended up in a previous version of SCCM, Windows will always end up on the right drive. We also made some changes to the Pixie TFTP window size. So back in 2007, there was a hotfix article, a KB article, that was kind of floating around that went through some steps that you could go through for tweaking the TFTP block size and window size in your environment. And the problem was that if you had certain network configurations, you'd end up with packets getting lost and Pixie wouldn't work in certain network segments. So when we looked at the fixes and the changes that that hotfix was making in 2007, we realized it was quite simple to implement into current branch. So now you can natively change via the registry the TFTP window and block size so that it works appropriately in your environment. And we've had great feedback from a couple of the customers that that was top of their priority list. We've also made a number of improvements to the install software update step within a task sequence. And the first one is we now give you the ability to specify whether we run the software update step from cached results or whether we go off to the software update point and reevaluate and bring down a latest version of the catalog. And the problem with this was if you've got a Windows 7 machine that a user's using, it's doing its regular software update scan, it's providing compliance data, it then receives, say, a Windows 10 operating system deployment step, reboots, goes through the steps, installs Windows 10, it gets to the install software update step, 
and it, by default, we use cached results. So it's looking at the Windows 7 applicability. So it'd quickly go through that step, it'd reboot, user would log on to Windows, and all of a sudden they'd get bombarded with a load of software updates to install. And there's good reasons that we do that, because if you're pushing out even a tens, few hundred of machines at the same time, we don't want, you have, we don't want these software update points being bombarded with requests, because that's likely to impact your network. So rather than change the behavior, all we've done is we've just exposed the ability for you to go in and untick this box. So the box there is, ooh, is current behavior. So if you want to use fresh results, if you want the task sequence to do a compliance scan, go ahead and untick that box, and we'll go ahead and run a software updates compliance scan against the software update point during the build so that the, so that the correct updates come down to the machine during the build, and you've not got users getting prompted for another reboot after the build is completed. But just bear in mind, if you're doing a mass deployment, it could cause problems to your network, and your network's guys could be ringing up and going, what the hell are you doing? We've also added a new variable for timeout of the software update scan. And we had feedback from a few customers that the, that the software update scan step during the task sequence was simply taking too long, it was timing out, and it was causing errors in the task sequence. And previously, we just had this set to 30 minutes. Static value, non-configurable. And the reason it was set to 30 minutes, someone decided that 30 minutes was sounded about right when they were writing the code however long ago. It's still set to 30 minutes by default because, well, why change it? It works for most people. But for those customers that see issues with the timeout and, and errors in their task sequence, they can go and set the SMS TS software update scan timeout, and they can set it to whatever they want. We've also fixed an issue that we didn't think was an issue. So we didn't think that there was ever going to be a situation where software updates and servicing plans clashed. However, not long after deploying release in 1602, we had customers saying that they deployed some software updates to a machine. They'd also deployed a Windows 10 servicing plan and then tried to rebuild through re-imaging. It got to the install software updates step, and Windows Update Agent was started trying to bring down the same Windows 10 upgrade that it had just gone through through imaging, and we were seeing clashes there. So we fixed the collisions that some customers were seeing with servicing plans during Windows 10 rollouts. We've also made a number of changes to the SMS TS log to help make troubleshooting a little bit easier, so we reference the other log files that you might want to go out and check. And we've also documented our guidance to install the latest Windows Update Agent. It's nothing new in terms of best practice, but we've put it out there on our documentation just to help you have those conversations with either your security team or your client team saying, look, we need to make sure we've got the latest version of the Windows Update Agent, so that's documented for your benefit. So that's what's already been released. Now let's look at what's coming up in some of the technical previews. We've changed the way that we do image capture. So we've added an uninstall client during build and capture step. And this replaces the previous step of prepare client for image capture. And again, this was a situation where we were kind of tripping over ourselves, doing something and, and working around a problem in, in, a, in a pretty long-winded way. And the problem was that the previous step would simply generalize the client on the machine that we're about to capture so that when we re-imaged, when we pushed that image out, there was no carryover from the, previous, from the previous client. So we ripped out the GUIDs and any other unique identifiers. But it actually made a bit of a problem when we then came to reinstall the client during image deployment. And speaking to the client team, working with the OSD team, we realized that it was actually easier to go and rip the client out completely and just install from scratch rather than trying to reinstall slash repair slash upgrade the existing client that's kind of half on the image that we previously captured. And actually, this is one reason we've seen customers using MDT to capture their image, even though they're going to deploy it with SCCM. They're continuing to use MDT because it gives them a clientless image for when they deploy it. So not that I want to kill the need for MDT or anything like that, but for those customers that only have MDT for their image capture because of this, it might just reduce your administrative overhead. And all we do is we remove it. There's no, nothing really fancy, just removes the client so that it's fresh in store when we come to install it during the build. The next issue, there's been 
reports from numbers of customers, lots of noise from people in the field around this one. One of my previous customers in a previous role experienced this problem. And the reason that this becomes a problem is that as modern devices get slimmer and maybe don't have keyboards, devices are less and less often having inbuilt Ethernet cards. So the way a build room might work is that rather than just having the Ethernet adapter attached to that, they have the USB to Ethernet adapter that they plug into a machine, pixie boot the device, and install the image, which is great for the first time that you do that. You take the machine out of the box, you plug in the USB adapter, Pixie works fine, you image it, you put it in the bag to give to the user, you get the next device out of the box, plug the same USB adapter in, oh, Pixie says no advertisements found. And the reason for that is because we're using unknown computer support, but that MAC address isn't unknown. We, we know it's that one sat in that box that's going off to Bob. So what we've done is we've added in the console the ability to specify known duplicate MAC addresses. So you can go and specify all of those adapters in your build room, specify them in the console, so that when you reuse that adapter, we'll ignore that MAC address, and we'll go ahead and we'll bring down the unknown deployment. And you simply set that in the hierarchy settings, and we've added the option here into the client approval and conflicting records. And if I click on add, you'll see that we have the ability to specify a MAC address for that exact reason that I just talked about, but we also have the option to set an SM BIOS GUID as well. And the reason for this is it actually allows us to fix two problems at once. So we have some customers that have very specialized machines, and what it turns out that those manufacturers of those machines are doing is they're simply duplicating exactly the same hardware set. So there's duplicate SMS BIOS GUIDs across maybe 100 machines in their environment, and it's causing them problems with conflicting records. So if you've got that scenario, you can also use this to work around that by specifying those known duplicate SMS BIOS GUIDs. And all we do is we just specify the MAC address, And the next time we try to build a machine with that, or multiple machines with that, they'll all work every single time. Oh, applause. Thank you. We've also added in 16.09 a Windows 10 edition upgrade. And this simply allows you to uplift machines from one edition to another. It's nothing new to Windows. You can do it through numerous methods, you can create provisioning packages, you can create scripts, you can, you can do it as a user with a credit card in the Windows Store, but now we have the ability for you to manage that centrally as an SCCM admin. And all you do is you specify the SKU that you want to upgrade to, or a, the product key or a license file, and you deploy that out to a collection of machines, and it's a bitless transfer, so there's no large package of Windows 10 that needs to go down. All we're doing is we're uplifting the SKU version. All the bits are already on the machine. So we'll simply do that uplift. And the biggest example is Pro to Enterprise. We'll just uplift that machine, and that machine will then have all of the advanced features that Windows, Windows 10 Enterprise provides. We support what Windows 10 supports. So you can do Home to Education, Pro to Education, Pro to Enterprise, Enterprise to Education, and also Mobile to Mobile Enterprise. And that's simply defined by what Windows 10 will allow you as a user to do using the, the, the CSP. So that's what we're able to light up for you in the console. So we're going to move away from what's coded and what's available for you to try either at the moment or very soon. And we're going to start looking at some of the stuff that's on our roadmap, that's on our list of things that we're hoping to work towards. And this is massively caveated. Everything else we've got in technical preview, there's some level of commitment to get that out to you. Everything else is, hey, guys, this is just stuff that we've heard, and it's stuff that we're going to work on. We've not started coding it necessarily, but it's just stuff that's top of our list, top of our priorities for operating system deployment. So don't hold me to any of this stuff. Don't hold Aaron to any of this stuff. But this is the kind of stuff that we're thinking about implementing in future builds. So the first one is that we're looking at a nested task sequence, the ability to run an existing one task sequence from an already running task sequence. 
And this will simply be lit up by the ability to There we go. We'll simply have a task sequence step called run task sequence. And it does what it says on the tin. It allows you to say, I've got this task sequence. I'm going to deploy this task sequence. I'd like the ability to call this task sequence from this one. And crucially, it's subject to the same task sequence logic that any step in a task sequence is already. So you can have multiple run task sequence steps and maybe have only one of them execute or none of them execute depending on whatever variables that you might have got set. That's all we've got on that. None of these slides have got anything else to show other than the title and what we're looking at and how it might work, but hopefully it gives you an idea of some of the things to be looking out for in future releases. The next one is something that's been in MDT for a while, and that's the ability to have language and region support during the operating system deployment. So the first thing, the first stream of this will be language pack support during the deployment or upgrade, and then also the ability to specify locale or time settings during the operating system deployment. And that will work across all of the different operating system deployment methodologies that we're looking at today. So imaging, servicing, upgrade, doesn't matter which route you're taking, we're looking at implementing that language and region support across, across the board for operating system deployment and Windows 10 servicing overall. A little bit of interest there, not, not quite as good as nested task sequence. And then finally, really in terms of operating system deployment roadmap, is customizable end user notification. For those of you that have been looking at the technical previews over the past couple of months, and I think we lit some stuff up in 1602, we're making a major push to provide more customizable end user notification. And the ultimate goal is to have all aspects of user interaction through the software center customizable so that you're not constrained to that one message that we decided in a meeting somewhere in Redmond that, yep, that's the perfect wording. And the one that we're looking at for operating system deployment is that notification that the user gets when they go, yep, install operating system. So the feedback we've had is that some users are a little bit scared by this and that they're not entirely sure that that might be something that they want to click on and help desk calls go in. I think I've got a virus. And you, no, no, it's fine. Just click install operating system. So the ability to customize that a little bit, maybe put the branding in there of the company name or maybe the reference to the internal project. But the idea is that, that that notification will be customizable so that the users maybe have a little bit more confidence in clicking that big dangerous button of install operating system. Okay. The next one's not strictly operating system deployment, but I was asked on Saturday by Karim, who, who looks after Boundary Group and content, if I could fit this in because he wanted to, to get it covered at Ignite. So this is something we've been working on for the past couple of months and is in fact in Technical Preview 1609. And we're changing the way that Content Lookup and Fallback works within Content Lookup. So feedback we've heard, and we've heard this loud, clear, and consistently from numerous customers, Fallback it's too hard to configure. I can't control when and how it happens. Failover between DPs takes too long. Again, I don't really have control of how and when it works. And crucially, SUP and MP affinity are absolutely crucial to our boundary groups. So from 1609 technical preview, there's a new user interface that allows you to set relationships between boundary groups. I like that, man. He went like that. There's a new UI that allows you to specify relationships between boundary groups. When you upgrade or when you install 1609, you'll see a new default boundary group per site. And we'll come on to why we have that. There's no more concept of fast and slow distribution points. We allow you to configure that elsewhere in the console in terms of the behavior. There's no, need, no longer any need to set allow fallback on a per deployment type basis. Again, fallback will just become something natively, and you'll specify per boundary group. One of the changes we've made is that by default, clients will move from distribution point to distribution point after two minutes of failure, rather than two hours of failure. So you'll see clients fail over much quicker in the new boundary groups. <laughs> a 
And there's no need to change anything. There's no panic once you've done the upgrade, once we hit this in production. The upgrade experience will be everything will continue as it did previously, and then it's up to you to go and then reconfigure and define your relationships that you want failover to work for. So let's have a look at how that might work for a client. So as you can see, I've got my site default boundary group for site XYZ, and I've got three boundary groups. I've got Redmond, I've got Bellevue, and I've got San Diego. And as you can see, there's a, a failover time or a fallback time in minutes set on each of those relationships. So by default, all boundary groups have a 120 minute fallback against the site default boundary group. And then for Bellevue, I've specified 10 minutes. And for San Diego, I've specified 20 minutes. So if I've got a client that's physically located in the Redmond boundary group, and it's trying to install an application, it will go off to its management point, and it will pull down a pool of available distribution points within its boundary group. And it will go through retrying content against those boundary group, against those distribution points every two minutes, DPR1, DPR2, DPR1, DPR2, two minutes between each distribution point until it either gets the content from one of those distribution points or we hit the 10 minute timeout that we've specified on the Bellevue boundary group. And then the client will simply add those distribution points to its content lookup and it will continue to cycle through every two minutes. So it'll prioritize its local DPs, so it'll go DPR1, DPR2, it will then include DPB1, DPB2, so on and so forth every two minutes until either it finds the content on one of those four distribution points or we another 10 minutes progresses so that we have a total of 20 minutes from when we first started looking for content and then we will add the San Diego distribution points to that list of content lookup. If that goes on for 120 minutes, will then include any distribution points that reside in the site default boundary group. I want to take this opportunity to do a little bit of a sales pitch. Who's familiar with Uservoice.com? OK, a few of you. So configurationmanager.uservoice.com is our way of, or your way, of providing feedback to the product group. And it allows you to simply go in and say, hey, I think this is a great idea. So you go in and you submit an idea, and then everyone else has the ability to upvote your idea. And as things go further and further up the list of what appears to be on customers' wish lists, that then starts to feed into our, de our decision making and our design making processes of what we're going to do going forward. And in fact, every single what's new point that I've talked about today there's a corresponding user voice article for. So to give you some stats, to date there's been 623 submitted ideas, and 60 of those are currently available in 1606. So that's a pretty good hit rate of ideas that you guys and the wider customer base are providing to the product group that we're going, yep, yeah, that's great, we're going to go and implement that. And the reason for that is that when the feature PMs and the engineering leads are sat in a meeting room in Redmond discussing what might make it into, a fee into an upcoming release. If we see that something's massively upvoted on user voice, we know that that's what customer wants. And if a customer wants something, we're going to prioritize that over something where someone's gone, hey, I think this is a good idea. If we know that customers want something, it's going to provide gravitas in that decision-making process. So, my ask of everyone in this room is to start using configurationmanager.uservoice.com and providing that feedback so that we can continue to give you what you guys want from SECM. So switching gears slightly, we're going to look at the different methods that you can use within your environment for deploying Windows 10. And we talked about upgrading Windows 10 at the beginning. So why would you upgrade to Windows 10? Why would you use that over imaging? And as I mentioned in the overview slide, it allows you to preserve your applications, your drivers, your user data, your settings. So 
the administrative overhead to take a user from one build of Windows 10 to another build of Windows 10, or from Windows 7, Windows 8 to Windows 10, should be significantly less through upgrading, because you don't need to go ahead and make sure all the drivers and all the applications and everything else are in the image or as part of the deployment. They're already there on the user's machine. They're using them, the settings, the data's there. So by upgrading, we simply preserve that. If that's not a compelling enough reason, compared to a, uh, compared to a refresh or a wipe and reload, upgrade is faster. On average, we see upgrades taking between 30 and 60 minutes for the upgrade process versus I've heard customers complain that their build process takes three, four hours because they've got so many applications and drivers and all the different stuff that their task sequence steps are doing. So upgrade is much faster. Part of that is that it's also smaller. So if you've got a massive image and a massive task sequence with lots of packages, there's a lot of data to be transferred to that machine. For the upgrade, all we do is we send the default, up, the default Windows 10 data down. So it's a much smaller payload that needs to be transferred to the client. And it's also more robust. So Windows provides a really robust, robust rollback or fallback if there's a failure that takes you back to the previously known good deployment of Windows. So if you've gone from Windows 7 to Windows 10 and it fails halfway through, if you've used upgrade, we'll get you back to a working scenario of Windows 7 rather than just some random error code that you need to plug into Trace32 in order to figure out what went wrong. A big advantage to upgrade is that there's zero ADK dependencies. We don't need the ADK for upgrade. All we're doing is we're leveraging the setup media of Windows 10. So it means that, especially if your organization comes to you and goes, I need to upgrade our 1511 Windows 10 boxes to Windows 10 16.07 tomorrow, and you go, ah, well, we need to get to 16.06 for Config Manager, and we need to get the Windows 10 16.07 ADK. You can use upgrading adk list to use the upgrade feature of Windows 10. And the idea is that you might use it to supplement your existing deployment scenario. So those bare metal scenarios, they're not going anywhere, but it's a good tool to have in the OSD toolbox. So when would you use upgrade versus refresh, or more particularly, when would you, use, when would you continue to use wipe and load versus upgrade? So those significant changes, the main membership change, any pre and post tasks that you want to take place as part of the task sequence. If you want to do a massive application uplift at the same time, task sequences and wipe and reload are probably still the way to go. We talked about those fundamental changes that you might be going through as part of your Windows 10. So you might be wanting to change your disk partitioning, that BIOS to UFI migration, x86 to x64. We can't upgrade a 32-bit operating system to a 64-bit operating system. These are all scenarios that are going to require you to do a wipe and reload still. And then also any custom requirements. If you want to customize your Windows PE or you want to customize the base image, we don't support you customizing the WIM for upgrading. So if you want to put any changes in, again, wipe and reload is the way to go. One great feature of Upgrade is that we can actually assess the readiness of the machine using a task sequence and, and using the servicing step. And we do this by leveraging the Windows Setup Compatibility Scan. And that's right there in the console. On the task sequence step, you simply tick the Perform Windows Setup Compatibility Scan without starting the upgrade, and it does exactly what it says. You tick that box and deploy a task sequence, a simple task sequence like that, it will report whether those machines that you've deployed that to are ready and capable of running Windows 10. And we do that by running setup.exe with the slash compat scan only switch. One thing to note is it requires the entire operating system upgrade package. It's not bitless. We have to transfer that WIM and setup.exe down to the machine in order to run that compatibility scan. But it does then return a variable that says whether there's any error message or whether we're good to go. So you could use this as a fact-finding mission, deploy it out to a bunch of machines to find out whether they're capable of running Windows 10. Or you can use this as a nice check method in your task sequence. So you can then use this task sequence variable to determine whether we then go on to upgrade the operating system properly or whether we back out of the change and leave the user running Windows 7 or Windows 8. So we can use this to then define later steps in the task sequence. 
And depending on the message that comes back, you'll get a number of different return codes. So success, there might be application compat issues for, for the applications. It um, might be that you can't do the upgrade from enterprise to uh, from professional to enterprise or enterprise to professional. It might be that the machine's not eligible for Windows 10, so it might be that it's too low powered, it's not got the right chipset, or it might just be good old fashioned, not enough disk space to perform this upgrade. So it allows you to intelligently determine whether we're going to even attempt to do the upgrade rather than getting either so far down that we then have to roll back or we just starts and it fails straight away. The next methodology that we have for deploying Windows 10 within the organization is provisioning Windows 10. And this is the scenario where it's great for maybe a BYOD scenario or for uh, CYOD, so choose your own device, where you're giving users more choices to the devices that they have, and they, rather than get a device provided to them via the IT department, they're actually just getting it out the box, booting it up, and going through some provisioning steps. So rather than having to image that machine, we can lay down configuration onto the native image that's been provided by the OEM and the manufacturer. So the provisioning vision is that you would plan, determine what you need to configure on those machines for those scenarios, create the provisioning package to ensure that you have the configuration that you require, and then you have a process where the user gets the device, boots it up, goes through whatever enrollment settings they need to go through, and we apply that provisioning package as part of that. And then once it's been provisioned and it's got the configuration and the lockdown that you need, it just becomes a normal device in your environment, and servicing becomes an ongoing feature via either the, M the MDM me mechanism of Windows in Tune or hybrid, or using the SCCM client installed on that machine. So how do we go about provisioning a machine? We do this using a provisioning package, and that provisioning package contains the configuration and the settings that we wish to apply. And we can do this at a number of stages in the life cycle. We create the provisioning package using the Windows Imaging and Configuration Designer, which is a feature of the Windows ADK. So you use the Windows ADK to create the package. And it can be deployed via Intune or SCCM. So if you're a hybrid standalone or hybrid, hybrid or Intune standalone or Config Manager standalone, it doesn't matter. You can leverage these provisioning packages for those scenarios. And it allows you to configure policy without having to image that machine. And there's a whole host of different settings that you can apply. Management enrollment, and one of the ones that we've already been through, is the addition upgrade. So that's something else that we can leverage as part of the provisioning package. So how do we go about applying this provisioning package to those devices that we as an IT department have taken the decision, we're going to give our users more control, so they go to Best Buy, pick up a device, go through some defined IT process, but the IT department aren't actually going to touch that device physically before the user gets it, so how do we go about allowing the user to do that? So we can apply that package during the out-of-box out experience, so the UBI, and to do this, we simply press the start button five times during the out-of-band experience, and it will give us the option to choose that provisioning package that we've been provided. And that can be through removable media as an SD card or a USB stick, or quite coolly, an NFC transfer of that provisioning package down to that device. We can also apply it during runtime. So we can simply provide the user with that PPKG file. Um, it's just simply a case of giving them the file to, to use. So it could be that we just simply email it to them. Not the most 21st century solution I know, but email certainly runs Microsoft. It might be that it's already on the device, if there's some kind of interaction with the device prior to giving it to the user. It might be from a USB stick again, or it might be we simply provide them with a link. It might be we've embedded it in the image. So it might be that we've said, hey, XYZ hardware manufacturer, can you include this file on your image? And you give them probably a large amount of money for that privilege, and then user boots the device and it's, it's automatically provisioned. And we're working on, or working closely with the Windows 10 product group to see if there's any advancements and changes that we can make to give even greater control to the IT admin as part of that provisioning experience. So finally, we're going to look at servicing Windows 7. And before we move into that, I'm just going to talk about what the Windows, of a service, Windows as a Service methodology is really intended to solve. 
So on the my right, your left, is the scenario of what we test when we release software. When we create an, a hotfix or an update to an operating system or an application, when our partners or vendors are writing software, they're going to be writing and testing their software against a fully patched PC. On the other side of the screen is probably what every single environment in this, or every single customer in this room is running, is they're picking and choosing the updates that they're going to apply to those machines. The problem with that is that you're then, say you skip two updates and you choose update C later on down the line. When we wrote and tested that update, we expected those first two updates to be on that machine. So there's interaction problems, and you get this fragmentation of Windows across the however many hundred million devices that are deployed worldwide. You end up with this fragmentation, and one user or one customer might get one experience, and then another gets this issue, and then this customer doesn't get either of the issues, they get something else. So the fragmentation causes this disjointed approach to how, how our customers and how our users are experiencing our software. So we have this stay current mentality with Windows as a service. And that's based on a current by default attitude. So we want customers and we want the machines to be up to date and patched and have, don't have that fragmentation. And the benefit is that it increases the security, the consistency across all of those customers' devices, the stability and the reliability as well. And it eliminates that fragmentation because every single machine in Windows 10 is exactly the same because you don't get that choice as to the different updates that you apply. And it means that we're a bit more flexible in writing of our tools and it gives us shorter time to test so that we can get you the updates quicker, which goes back to what I said at the beginning around Windows 10, Office 365. We're providing these updates, other product groups are providing their updates, so we need to reduce our test burden so that we can get you those updates and those feature changes as quickly as possible. And all being well, that's going to reduce your admin overhead as well, because you're able to quickly roll out updates and you're not hitting issues because you've made a decision six months ago to ignore this patch because you don't think that it's applicable to your environment. So we showed this slide at the beginning, but just a recap as to the different builds available within Windows as a service, each increasing in size within your environment as you go through. So Windows inside a preview, current branch, and current branch for business, and then hopefully a small, if non-existent, portion of your environment running long-term servicing branch. So within the Windows as a service model, there's two types of updates that Windows release. We have the quality updates, and we have the feature updates. So the quality updates is that single cumulative update each month that contains the security fixes, bug fixes, any reliability fixes that we need to include. And it supersedes the previous month's updates. And there'll be no new features that are included as part of that quality update. The feature updates are those twice a year updates that Windows are releasing that are the new capabilities, the new features that allow us to move from build to build. And it's a very reliable upgrade with that ability to roll back should something go wrong. And we can try out any new features in the Insider Preview as they're released to Insider Preview before making it through to the current branch and current branch for business. In terms of how the timeline and the rhythm for those updates work, each of the diamonds represents when Windows have launched that particular update, and we've got a hypothetical release down at the bottom. The pilot period is while that build is in current branch. So that's where you're testing and making sure that the build is correct for you. And then the deploy slash use is that current branch for business period where you've moved over and you've started deploying and rolling out en masse. So how do we prepare SCCM in order to support Windows as a service? Windows as a service runs on WSUS, and in Config Manager, that means that it runs on software update management. It has a core dependency of WSUS 4.0. So if you're running Windows Server 2008 R2 for your site servers and your software update points, you're going to need to uplift those to at least Windows Server 2012 so that you can upgrade your WSUS environment to WSUS 4 so that you can start to benefit from the Windows as a service. 
Windows made some changes in WSUS 4.0 that allowed them to run the Windows as a service. It's not available on WSUS 3, which is what runs on Server 2008 R2. As well as WSUS 4.0, you're going to need this particular hotfix, and that hotfix details all the steps that you need to go through for preparing the WSUS environment for Windows as a service and the servicing approach. And as I say, you're going to need Windows Server 2012 or greater on the SUP, on the software update point, because that's where the WSUS components run. But also, anyone that's installed Configuration Manager will know that you need the WSUS console on the site server, because we leverage APIs that that provides. So you need to have the site server also at that version. And then you need to go in and you need to check the upgrades classification in the software update sync. We also have a dependency on heartbeat discovery. So we've gone and extended and added, added a couple of new properties to heartbeat discovery in current branch. And we'll talk about what those, what those changes are. But we use those as part of the servicing approach. It's also recommended that you have the service connection point. So the service connection point is a new role in current branch that provides a connection back to Microsoft so that we can provide you with the updates such as 1602 and 1606, they come down through the service connection point. And it's recommended that you have that in offline mode because there's a transfer of information around Windows 10 so that we pull down the latest statistics on which builds of Windows 10 are available. You can do it offline. It's just easier if you have the service connection point online. So we will transfer it as part of that offline sync, but it's recommended that you have it in online so that you get those changes quicker. And then finally, you need to have the GPO setting of defer upgrades and updates configured as part of group policy. So I talked about the changes to heartbeat discovery. We've added a property called operating system build, and that simply has the build number of the device that the heartbeat discovery is from. And we can also see the operating system readiness branch. So you can see that this one's set to do not defer updates. So this is set to current branch. In the console, through the properties pane, as you can see, that's a, a nice verbose text description of the branch. Behind the scenes, that's actually set to an integer value. So 0 is current branch, 1 is current branch for business, and 2 is LTSB. And you can use that like you can any other property within the SCCM database. So you can create reports, create collections, based on the rings that you've defined within your environment. As you start to look at servicing within your environment, we've talked about current branch, and we've talked about current branch for business. So when a build becomes release ready, that simply means that Windows have released that build, and it's available as current branch. The build then becomes business ready once they've enabled it and turned it on as for current branch for business support. If you've got 20 devices in your environment, then yeah, those two distinct points might work. You have a pilot of five machines, you check that that works, and then 60 days later, it goes current branch for business, and you roll out the other 15 machines. Any more than that, and those two single points on that timeline probably aren't going to fit your requirements. If you've got 400,000 devices, your boss probably isn't going to just let you push out 400,000 updates within a day or two. So within that, you then might define your own rings, your own build timelines. So we release current branch, current branch, and then you have a pilot. You have your early adopters start to test that out, kick the tires, make sure that they're happy with how Windows 10 is working in their environment. You might then have a slightly bigger early adopter rollout a month later, and you start to expand how that gets rolled out within your environment. And then we hit CBB. Maybe you start then stepping that out to a, a slightly bigger initial deployment. And then over the course of the life cycle of that current branch for business, you start to roll out bigger and bigger deployments until you get to the point where all of your Windows 10 machines have been uplifted to the latest version of current branch for business. So this is really where you get to define your rings. And you can do this natively with the servicing plans. And we'll show you how to create one of those in a minute. It easily keeps you current because you set it once, and they just continue to run. So you do it now for 1607 in however long when Windows 10 released their next update. Those servicing plans will still apply. So you can set once, 
and then just monitor them ongoing to make sure that everything's still working as you expect. So how does a servicing plan work? It's actually just an automatic deployment rule that we've added a couple of extra bits to make it specific for the Windows 10 upgrades process. So we've added this notion of deployment rings so that you can specify plus however many days. So you say CB plus one day, CB plus 90 days, CBB plus two days, CBB plus 90 days. You specify the time lag between the build hitting a certain lifecycle point plus that number of days, and we'll start to roll it out automatically within Config Manager. We've also added the ability to filter the upgrade classification as part of the servicing plan, and I'll show you why that's important in a minute. And currently, the servicing plans are only for features. If you want to do those quality updates, then you'll need to have an ADR as well to continue to do those automatic updates within the, win within the quality updates. So it's currently only for features. And on the client side, it's initiated by Windows Update. So Windows Update launches the Windows setup and automatically goes through the upgrade initiated by Windows Update. And in terms of troubleshooting, I know people are always keen on how do I troubleshoot this, and more specifically, what logs do I look at? SCCM's great with logs. So on the client side, if you can already troubleshoot software updates, you'll be able to troubleshoot Windows servicing, plus a couple of extra log files thrown in for, for good measure. Similar story on the server side. It's exactly the same as an automatic deployment rule. There's no new components. We're just leveraging exactly the same code un underneath. So if you can troubleshoot ADRs, you'll be able to troubleshoot servicing plans, not a problem. So let's have a quick look at how servicing plans work. So first off, I have my Windows 10 servicing dashboard, and I can see the state of my environment and the rings that are available, and it's color-coded. So the big blue is my release ready. So that's my current branch Windows 10 deployments in my environment. I then have my business ready, which is the dark blue. So these are the, build, these are the Windows 10 machines that are running current branch for business. And then finally, any machines that are running long-term servicing branch. If I scroll down, I can see the monitoring of my different servicing plans. There's not actually any data in any of those. This environment got uplifted just the other day. In terms of creating a service plan, simply go into the console, create servicing plan, and I give it a name. So this is going to be my pilot. And I specify the collection that I want my servicing plan to go to. And then here I'd start to specify my rings. So Windows have said this is current branch and this is current branch for business, but this is where I can start to be more nuanced in how I start to roll out my upgrades. So this is my pilot, so I'm going to go with release ready, which is current branch. And I'm going to set that to three days. So three days after that update hits the Windows Update servers and gets synchronized into my WSUS environment, three days after that, the machines in this collection will start to upgrade using the servicing channel. And then here is where I can filter and create that servicing plan. So if I just hit Preview, you'll see it brings in 256 results. And the reason for that is there's a bunch of Windows 7 and Windows 8. And there's also all the different language versions that, that exist within my environment. So first of all, I'm going to filter that down to English. And then I'm also going to specify title. I think it's enterprise comma.
And if I now hit preview, you'll see that that brings in a much shorter list. Click next. I can then specify my scheduling in exactly the same way that anyone that's ever even remotely thought about setting up a deployment or an advertisement in Configuration Manager, you get exactly the same behavior. So how long after the update going available do I want it to show as available to the client? So because this is a pilot, I'm going to say as soon as possible. And then installation deadline, so how many days after it going live do I want them to install it? I'm going to change that to four days. So what that means is that that's the three days that I've specified as my ring, that within seven days of Windows releasing, releasing a new current branch, my pilot collection will be updated to that latest version. I can change my user experience. So I'm going to say display in Software Center. It's a pilot group, so they're, they're briefed on how to deal with that. I can specify any update restarts or maintenance window overrides. And then I have to specify which deployment package I want to apply that to. So I'm going to go in place upgrade, one I created earlier. Do I download this from the internet, or is it something I've downloaded previously? Exactly the same way that you would do for software updates. Click next. And that's that. And that rule, that rule runs on a schedule in the same way that an automatic deployment rule runs. And those machines will automatically get uplifted. And I can create multiple servicing plans, one for each of my rings within my environment. And I can set that once, and I can then put my feet up for the rest of my career, because Windows 10 is just going to automatically upgrade itself. Probably find something to make me look busy when my boss walks around. But as far as he's concerned, I'm yeah, continually working on my Windows 10 process. So when would you use a servicing plan versus a task sequence? So for Windows 7 or Windows 8.1 uplifts to Windows 10, that servicing plan won't work. That servicing plan is only for Windows 10 build to build. If we want to leverage the Windows as a service uplift from Windows 7 or Windows 8, you need to use a task sequence to initiate that. The user experience will vary depending on whether you use a task sequence or a servicing plan. If you use a task sequence, obviously, they're going to see the task sequencing user experience. If you're using the servicing plan, that's going to be the software updates, traditional experience. The administrative effort is greater for a task sequence, because you're going to have to recreate that for each new build of Windows. But as I just said, for the servicing plan, that's just going to go into a rolling process of every time Windows release an update, we'll go ahead and reflect that in the servicing plan. So it'll just continually uplift those machines based on the rings that you've specified. There are some advantages to the task sequence, as you can see on the column there. So if you want to include driver maintenance, if you want to include language packs, if you want to do any pre and, pro st pre and post steps as part of the build or the uplift, you're going to need to use a task sequence and have additional steps for that. And if there are any encryption requirements to decrypt or re-encrypt a device, again, task sequences are going to give you that extra level of control. So the last few slides. Mobile device servicing, so we can manage Windows mobile devices and control the uplift there and define the rings. You specify that through Intune or through hybrid or on-prem MDM. And you need to create a custom URI, and you can simply specify the period that it takes for those devices to be uplifted. A couple of extra points. Insiders gives you that early access to the latest build, so you can see the features that are coming down the line. And there is also the Windows Update for Business, which basically allows you to defer your update process to Microsoft and will determine when the best time for those updates to be installed. There are a couple of management issues if you're using SCCM. So the first one is that we don't get that compliance information into Config Manager, because that information is not being provided to our WSUS system. So it doesn't surface things like endpoint protection monitoring, software update compliance. If you want to do things like third-party updates, if you're leveraging System Center Updates Publisher, again, Windows Update for Business has no notion of that. So you'd need to use the native SCCM update mechanism. 
And also, if you're using WSUS to deploy your client, again, you're going to need to continue to use your own WSUS environment. So the guidance and the process that you go through is that you have insiders for, pre for pilot, have those multiple servicing plans so that you can define your rings, use the automatic deployment rules for any of the quality updates, and then finally have the task sequence for those specific requirements. So in summary, and I'd be remiss, I kind of owe it to Aaron to, to say this again, if you want to go fast with Windows 10, you've got to go fast with SCCM. Imaging isn't going anywhere. It's still there. It's still used quite heavily by most of our customers. But that toolbox of operating system deployment is increased with Windows 10 and SCCM. And the other thing is I'd encourage you to not have this mindset. The most dangerous thing for any organization for, or for any process is the concept of, ah, we do it that way because that's the way we've always done it. If you find yourself saying that, give yourself a long, hard look in the mirror because you're possibly ignoring changes in technology that will make your life easier. So it's always a good idea to have this rolling process of rethinking processes and saying, hey, is this the best way to achieve our end goal? And then finally, leverage the technical previews. I've had a couple of customers past couple of days and also customers that I engage with asking me for roadmap discussions. And actually, the best way for you to see what's on our roadmap is to be consuming those technical previews. They're a free download. Use those technical previews and see what features we're working on. Because there's no feature that makes it into the production build that hasn't gone through the technical preview. So that really is the best way to see what we're working on and what's upcoming. And then finally, just to reiterate, be active on user voice. And that might be going on and submitting ideas, or it might be just going on and seeing what other ideas people have submitted and upvoting those. Because chances are, if you've got an idea, someone else has had that idea and it's already there. And if it's not there, chances are there's a bunch of other people that think that's a good idea and will upvote it for you. And you never know, you might get your feature in the product. So there's a couple of other sessions the rest of the week. I've highlighted the SCCM one specifically. So Jason's going to be going through the overview of Intune and Configuration Manager and also looking at Windows 10 management later on in the week. And finally, please submit your evals. It's really important to the conference organizers so that they make sure that the sessions and the event is the event that you guys are wanting. And it also is important to us because it's kind of dependent on my self-worth to see what you guys think of the session. So if you're not doing it for the conference, guys, do it for me. And I think we've pretty much run out of time. But if anyone has any questions, please feel free to come up or shout out the questions. <laughs>